Hello everyone, Nate Fairley here, Regional Agronomy Manager for Bex Hybrids, covering our Western region. And today when I think about our topic of our Insight meetings this year, investing money to make money, I start thinking about what are some of the small additions that, that I can make for big profits. Now these small additions come in many shapes and sizes. Maybe it's a small dollar amount that we're investing in. Uh, maybe it's just a small application rate of a nutrient to maximize that growth potential of our crop. Or maybe it's just simply a small time investment. So today we're going to explore some of those small additions for big profits, starting with sulfur. Now when I think of sulfur, I think of this picture, and there's a lot of irony here. And, and the irony is because it's because of this green movement causing, uh, with all these uh, solar panels being built, that's really causing a need for sulfur. And so when you think about the, the uh, emissions controls and, and less sulfur in our atmosphere, uh, we have to add that sulfur. But the reason I really put this up there is because it poses a question that I think is really unique, and that's why are these solar panels that are going up all over dark? Why are they black or why are they blue? Why aren't they white? Well, it's the same reason as a kid out walking soybeans, we chose to wear a white t-shirt instead of a black t-shirt. And that's the darker colors absorb more sunlight. And that's what I think about with sulfur. I think of sulfur addition helping build more chlorophyll, getting that plant darker to absorb more sunlight, especially important in soybeans because we know sunlight collection is the key to yield on soybeans. So there's a few factors on sulfur that we really have to consider. And, and as I said earlier, with the, with the least amount of sulfur, less amount of sulfur in the atmosphere today, you know, that's probably the number one reason why we're seeing such a strong response to sulfur in our research. Going back to you know, 1990s, early 90s, you know, we could collect anywhere from 20 to 30 part per million of sulfate from the atmosphere. Uh, going back just to 2016, you know, we're barely collecting three to four pounds. And so we're not getting that same atmospheric sulfate as we used to. The other thing we got to consider is our soil results. When we look at ANL Great Lakes Labs data, we see that there's a declining trend. Uh, now, I don't like to stick out in the negatives because yes, there's a declining trend, but in this data set, there's also a flat line starting to take place. And I think that's because about that 2010, we realized that there was a really nice response to sulfur. So I know you guys are probably adding sulfur in your corn program pretty regularly, uh, and that's helping, but I still think there's a need for more, and here's why. Because when we look at the requirement of sulfur uh, for our crops, we look at corn, let's use about 240 bushels, you know, we're needing about 36 pounds. Soybeans, 80 bushels, we're needing about 28 pounds. And so uh, looking through this graph here, atmosphere, I already said we get about three pounds. Uh, organic matter is gonna give us about 12 if we're at a 3%. So if you can do the math there, we're using four pounds per percent of organic matter. Uh, we still on corn are needing to apply around 20 pounds uh, and 13 pounds on average for soybeans. Uh, so let's look at some considerations when we're making this decision. Organic matter, number one consideration to make. Uh, going back to this deposition map, I put up there five of our practical farm research locations. And, and just to compare, see what these organic matter differences are. Uh, we have 5% organic matter where I'm from in Minnesota, very blessed with that. Uh, and then down to 2% here in Kentucky. And so you look at the spread on that in sulfur. If we're using four pounds per percent, that's a pretty big spread. You know, I can see as high as 20 pounds just from my organic matter, mineralizing in my soil, free to me. Uh, where in Kentucky, we're maybe only getting eight. So number one consideration to make is know the soil that you're planting on and don't just go by your highest organic matter either. Uh, that sulfur is mobile and it won't be that residual nutrient for your crop next year. So look at maybe what that average or the low end is to make that sulfur decision if we're using organic matter as that key decision maker. Looking at the source of sulfur, uh, many different products out there, uh, but I like this graph because it starts with the time of application. Uh, sometimes if we're going out with a fall application of a P and K, it just makes sense that's where we're gonna get our sulfur. We don't have the ability to put it on with a planter or spray it. So we look at that fall application, we're gonna wanna stick with more of an elemental product, something that's gonna take a longer time to break down. If we're going in our spring, 
pre-plant, that's where we can get some products that have more sulfate, more available sulfur to the plant uh, in that product, in that fertilizer that we're buying and applying at that time. And then in that growing season, uh, making sure that the sulfur source that we're applying is available. It is a mobile nutrient. I don't like banking on that for another year's crop. So target that crop that we're looking at uh, and apply the sulfur that we need. Let's look at some PFR data. Looking at some practical farm research data from this last year, a one-year study, we thought, hey, we kind of figured out what that rate is, but, but what about the timing? Do we have to change the rate of application to the timing? And also we thought, hey, we could build a study that might help identify what that nitrogen to sulfur ratio is. Uh, we hear that a lot, that if I'm putting out you know, 200 pounds of nitrogen, I have to have X amount of sulfur. So uh, it's kind of a busy graph, and you'll find this in your practical farm research book, uh, but we're seeing as high as a 33 to one nitrogen to sulfur ratio down to a five to one. And, and it's interesting because uh, really what we learned out of this isn't so much that a, a particular timing stood out or ratio stood out. What really stood out was the hybrid response. And looking at this graph, you can see how clear that is. 6282, every application of sulfur at every rate showed a positive ROI. 6374, every application rate and timing showed a negative ROI. Uh, one of the, those aha moments that we have in PFR every year that really jumped out to our team was, was this, that, hey, I think we're seeing a hybrid response to sulfur. So I know it adds another equation, another factor into that equation for identifying how much sulfur we need, uh, but the moral on corn is just, you know, know your organic matter, know that we need to have 35, 40 pounds out there to achieve our goal, and then apply. And it's not that much. It's a small addition of sulfur for that corn crop. Let's look at soybeans. Uh, soybeans, again, another study that we did this year, one-year study, new to PFR in 2021. We're looking at that two-by-two-by-two by two by two system and what we can apply with that on our soybean crop. If we're investing in that system on our corn crop, can we see a positive ROI utilizing that to apply a product on our soybeans? And so we used uh, 30 units of nitrogen in the form of UAN, two gallons of thiosulfate, and three gallons of a nutrient blend product uh, that's called Feast Yield Master. And, and although the sulfur wasn't the highest ROI, there's something to note. It took 2.2 bushels of soybeans to get us an $8.30 ROI. It only took 0.9 bushel to get us a six. And that excites us because we started to see some really big differences in that sulfur application in our, in our studies. And here's a breakdown. Going back to that deposition map where our organic matters are. This is where that organic matter plays a big play in how much sulfur we need for that soybean crop. On my home farm there, our Minnesota Practical Farm Research site, a negative 0.8 bushel response to two gallons of thiosulfate. And down here on our low organic matter, a 2.6 bushel response. So that 0.9 bushel you know, is our multi-location data, which is important, but looking at it really honing in on where those where those organic matters are, how much natural sulfur we're getting from that organic matter, and how it responds to yield. So uh, I do believe sulfur is a very important nutrient for our soybean crop, and if we're gonna start pushing those yields to 80, 90, we gotta look at sulfur. It's a small need, but it can give us a really big, big profit. All right, let's look at sugar. Sugar's the next small addition for a big profit, and it's a small addition in the form that this is a small input cost. These sugar products don't cost a lot. We're not investing 10, 15, 20 dollars an acre into this. We're talking somewhere in that two to six dollars an acre per application. And we've been testing sugar at Practical Farm Research for almost 10 years now. And what we've really found in that Practical Farm Research is a sugar application, foliar in furrow, gives us a positive ROI. I'll end with sharing some of those multi-year data sets, PFR proven sugar products. Uh, but to share with you why we're thinking about sugar again is, is this question, you know, what herbicide are you planning to use in 2022? Uh, we'd all love to say that I wanna spray the same Liberty program I did last year, or I've got my Enlist figured out, or I've got my Extend program dialed in. Uh, but with the chemical concerns that there are today, we may end up going back to some of those Flexstars or Cobras. And so we looked at that last year in, in PFR and we thought, hey, what products exist that might help that plant recover from that Flexstar application? So we designed what we call a stress mitigation study. And in that stress mitigation study, we tested some products that are micronutrients, 
or they're a, a, a stimulant for that plant to help it metabolize that chemical and recover quicker. And then we threw in a sugar product, a PFR proven sugar product, because we've heard from growers like you, hey, I'm using sugar with my Flexstar or my Cobra and it's reducing the burn. And what we saw from our multi-location data was that that sugar gave us a really nice response. 2.7 bushels, giving us a $30 ROI. One year, uh, multi-location, but again, that sugar can help mitigate that stress. It can help that plant metabolize that chemistry. I like to say it this way. We think we make these herbicide decisions based on maybe five or six patches of weeds in the whole field. If you did the percentage of weeds compared to the percentage of crop, we're spraying a lot more of our crop and we don't want that chemical to have a negative effect on it. So maybe we ought to start thinking about putting something in that tank that will mitigate that negative effect on the crop that we don't want to have a negative impact on. Uh, so sugar stood out to us. I do want to share this. A lot of questions are about sugar over the last couple of months since we had this stress mitigation study. And, and, and the question is, how does sugar really work? Now, going back to 2019, but we did BRICS readings to identify to see, is that sugar actually converting to a sugar molecule within the plant? Meaning, you know, that plant builds its own sugars. We know that through the photosynthesis process. But adding sugar, is it going to help that bank? Are we going to build that level up that will then translocate into grain? And what we found is that it didn't matter what sugar product we used, we didn't add to the plant-built sugar. Uh, so it, it really goes to test or really goes to prove a theory that, that we're testing, and that's to identify how, how that sugar is working. I think how it's working is we're, we're feeding the biology. So think of, a, think of an aphid, for instance. It's going to attach that soybean and it's going to suck out those plant-built sugars. Uh, and so if we can give that aphid or give that, that bug something to consume, a sugar source uh, to consume, it'll, it won't have an effect on those plant-built sugars, allowing for more of those natural plant-built sugars to translocate into grain. Uh, so I think that's where we're seeing that yield response on that. Uh, we're going to look more into the, the how on sugar. So we're kind of reopening these sugar conversations. Uh, but I just wanted to point out this to end. You know, we have four... PFR proven products that have sugar as their, their base, uh, base component. It, it's the base component of these products. And, and look at the cost of them. Uh, we're seeing some six, some 12, some $9 ROIs. Uh, what product to use really becomes down to what's available to you and then what fits your operation. Do you have the time to break down a dry product uh, like a feed grade dextrose to make sure that it's in a liquid form? Uh, or do you have room in that tank for a higher use rate or a lower use rate? So many factors can come into play on what sugar to use, uh, but use this as the guide to get that process started. So let's look at another small addition for a big profit. And this one comes in the form of time. Uh, so we all know time is money, and sometimes we have to allocate where we spend that time to be the most profitable. And I'm here to share with you that a small time investment of yours into our farm server tool can make you a lot of money. And it's going to do it in many different ways, but most importantly, it's, it's through our scouting. So I look at this as a, as a decision-making tool. Okay, This isn't collecting data from the field. Rather, this is taking your data and helping it become a decision tool for you. And so we have a lot of cool features in, in this, you know, storing our yield data, but then putting ROIs to it. You know, where are the most profitable acres on that farm? And then the scouting feature. The scouting feature coupled with our growth stage model alerts is really where we're gonna see the power of, of our farm server tool. It's very simple. Simply enter a planting date, enter our relative maturity of our crop, so you don't even have to have mapping on the planter to let this tool go to work for you. And then just let the growth model, growth stage model go to work. And this is how it works. So we're looking at our growth stage. Let's jump all the way up here to VT. So we know, we've heard today and through our insight meetings, that that growth stage VTR1 is extremely important for that fungicide application. But how do we know when it's there? Are we scouting every day to identify that? We'll let the tool send us that notification. We're going to get a notification ahead of time saying, your crop is entering that VT or R1 growth stage. Here are some helpful tools to help you increase the profitability of the pass that you're about to make. Maybe it's how much water we're putting out there, or you know, maybe what time of day we're going out there. So putting a lot of helpful tools in your hands without you having to invest the time to find them, sending that information right to you. 
The girl stage model, uh, I really get excited about on soybeans. We spent a lot of time over the last years trying to educate on how to identify that R3 soybean. Hey, let farm server do it for you. And then probably the most important here is, is wheat. Uh, I'm not very good at girl staging wheat. I don't have a lot of wheat in my area, but we know how important those girl stages are on wheat. So new to farm server this year is the girl stage modeling on wheat. And finally, I want to talk about a, the last small addition for big profits, and that's a new study this year, and it's our telk replacement study. And so telk, uh, telk is that product we're applying to our seed, whether we're sprinkling it in the row unit or blending it on as we're transferring that seed from our tender to our planter. Uh, but it's designed to really lubricate that seed, make sure it doesn't bridge, uh, help our row units work at their max efficacy, and then in our center fill planters, just make sure that that seed is getting delivered out to those rows uh, consistently. So uh, very important in the singulation process, in the mechanics of how the planter works, but it's a great opportunity to add, whether it's a biological or a micronutrient product. And so that's why we've designed this test, is really to look at uh, multiple different products and see is there a yield advantage and an ROI along with it. So looking at some of the products we tested, starting with dust. Dust is a, a safe for humans, made 100% from soybeans, uh, not a telc or graphite. Uh, it's just safe for human handling. No biological in there with it, uh, no micronutrient, uh, but just that safe handling. Uh, grow pack. Grow pack is a biological product uh, that is right on that seed. And you think about that, where that biome, where that biological activity is really important, right around that seed, right from the start, right from the get-go. Uh, PMZ dry, a blend of micronutrients. And then seed plus graphite, again, a blend of micronutrients. And we think of some of our micronutrients, a small addition, uh, it doesn't take much. You think of, you think of a, a nutrient like a boron, we're only talking 0.4 pounds per year. Uh, so some of those micronutrients, if we can get them applied on the seed, we're making sure that that small rate per acre is placed right where we need it. What's the data say? Uh, looking at that year one data on corn, we actually had dust, the product that doesn't deliver the micronutrients or the biologicals showing that highest ROI. Now we did do stand counts and we had the same stand populations, same singulations. So we're not sacrificing what that telt graphite blend is doing, uh, but we're just bringing some more beneficials along for the ride. So first year study on that, on corn sea and dust as our highest return on investment. And on soybeans, looking at grill pack. So getting that, that biological culture around the seed, getting it in that seed zone right where it needs to be. So as I look at PFR each year, I, I try and identify, you know, what are some of the aha moments on a big investment. And today, thank you for coming along with me as I share some of those small aha moments, those small additions for big profits. For more information, contact your local BEX representative or reach out to any of your agronomists or PFR staff. We'd be happy to help answer any questions you have.